Hey, thank you for joining us for today's event, hosted by the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. I'm Mark Montgomery, Senior Fellow at FTD and Senior Director of FTD's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation. I'm really pleased to be joined by a stellar lineup today to dis discuss Taiwan, a beleaguered democracy in a tough neighborhood. Earlier this year, FTD released two memos which laid out analysis and recommendations for a clear-eyed approach that Washington, Washington should take to counter the Chinese Communist Party's attempts to coerce Taiwan. In Taiwan 194, my colleagues, Jonathan Chanzer, Rich Goldberg, and I detailed a diplomatic approach where Taipei and its uh, allies and partners, taking a page from the Palestinian playbook, can regain recognition at the United Nations and in other international organizations. In Battle Force 2025, Representative Mike Gallagher challenges the Pentagon strategy of integrated deterrence and soft power to deter Chinese aggression against Taiwan. Instead, his paper provides a bold 10-step blueprint, a strategy of deterrence by denial that the United States can begin to implement. So today we're joined by the report's authors, Jonathan Janzer and Representative Mike Gallagher, as well as FTD's China program chairman, Matt Pottinger, to dive deeper into identifying how Washington can use all instruments of power to defend and advance the free people of Taiwan across military, information, diplomatic, and economic domains. But before we jump into the conversation, allow me to give a kind of share a more a detailed uh, description of each of our speakers. Representative Mike Gallagher is a US Marine Corps veteran with a combat tour in Iraq who now represents Wisconsin's 8th District. He serves on the House Armed Services Committee and was recently appointed to the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. We're proud to have Mike as a member of FTD's National Security Alumni Network. And I'm proud to have served with him as uh, when he was co-chair of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission alongside Senator Angus King. We're also fortunate to have Matthew, uh, Matt Pottinger, FTD's China Program Chair, who served for four years on the National Security Council, including as Deputy National Security Advisor, as well as Senior Director for Asia, where he was widely regarded as the, as the architect of the administration's work on the Indo-Pacific region and China. And finally, we have uh, Jonathan Chancer, FTD's Senior Vice President for Research overseeing the organization's numerous research portfolios. He previously worked as terrorism as a terrorism finance analyst at the Treasury Department. Before I, I begin, I'll note that FTD is a nonpartisan research institute exclusively focused on national security and foreign policy. It is a source for timely research analysis and policy options. It takes no foreign government money or foreign corporate funding. For more information on our work, you can visit us at FTD.org or find us on Twitter at FTD. So I'm gonna jump right into the questions uh, for, for Representative Gallagher. Sir, I, I know congressmen don't have a lot of free time and really, you know, uh, think tanks are supposed to be writing long papers. What prompted you to write this uh, extensive policy paper? Well, I'm a failed academic, of course, Mark. So I had to write something to pretend like I was doing something with uh, degrees uh, that I've gotten in the past. But I think the reality is based on everything I've observed in my six years in Congress, based on the many conversations I've had with my good friend, Matt Pottinger, to whom the nation owns a, owes a great debt of gratitude, I feel like time is running out to solve the most important national security problem of this decade. Uh, last year, Admiral Davidson put Washington on notice when he warned that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan could come within the next six years. This assessment was then echoed by the Commandant and the Chief of Naval Operations, it was reinforced by scholars such as the Naval War College's Andrew Erickson, who's described the 2020s as the decade of maximum danger. Even President Biden, during his inaugural address at the UN General Assembly, described the 2020s as the decisive decade. And I thought about this concept of a decisive decade and then thought about how the Pentagon has all these different plans for how we're going to reverse negative trends and get our act together and what we would call the out years, the far out years. Uh, Battle Force 2045 was a concept at the end of the last administration where we're betting on magical weapons that are going to come online in the 2030s. That is too far out. And it strikes me as insane that we're putting all our eggs in this future basket when anyone who is paying attention can tell you the threat is here and now. And I think if there's going to be any silver lining to the horrific conflict in Ukraine, I thought maybe it would wake up Washington, D.C. to the near-term threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party to Taiwan, 
But if anything, even after the consequences of modern state on state warfare have been on full display in Ukraine, the department seems to be moving backwards in its ability to deter a Taiwan invasion. Take the Navy, which is hemorrhaging near term force structure as part of its divest to invest budget imposed strategy buying fewer ships, early retirements, our fleet is going to shrink to from just under 300 ships today to 280 in fiscal year 2027, bottoming out at the worst moment, the peak of Admiral Davidson's window. So, you know, I didn't know how bad the divest to invest strategy was going to get in the new budget when I wrote this paper, uh, but I did know that the Pentagon was not acting with a sense of urgency. And I honestly believe that unless we move quickly, urgently in the next couple of years, we are going to see conflict in uh, Taiwan. And we may not win that conflict on the current trajectory. And I think all of us should be working together to figure out how we deter an invasion and if necessary, defeat the PLA in a conflict over Taiwan. Hey, thanks. Uh, you remind me that in your paper, you had a, a great point that 2027, the, the date Admiral Davidson said, uh, it can be affected. It can be affected by actions by the United States and Taiwan. It's not a firm line. And so uh, your, your paper makes a great point of uh, articulating how to change that. So I'd like to ask you to kind of pick between your children here of, of the 10 uh, points you had in there. What are the two or three that you think are really must do items from your memo? Well, I'd sort of lump a few of them in under the umbrella of enhancing our forward posture and the number of fires we have in the region. So that means hardening and expanding air defenses at existing U.S. and allied facilities in places like Guam and Japan, constructing new expeditionary bases on U.S. possessions across the Pacific, like Midway, Wake, establishing a sustained presence in the compact states, and massing pre precision fires across the region you know, draw, you know, implementing the Marine Corps expeditionary advanced base operations, for example, the goal of all of that is to create what I would call a defense in depth across the Pacific that not only uses ground based missiles to begin to reverse the cost curve and provide US forces with an affordable way to mass fires that can hold Chinese targets at risk, but also provides um, a 24 seven US presence in the region that deters our enemy and reassures our allies. The second must do in my mind involves building munitions capacity, building stockpiles, stockpiles. Just look at the battlefield in Ukraine and you'll see that in major war, we're gonna burn through precision guided munitions at an extraordinary rate. For example, at current production rates, we've given Ukraine seven years worth of Javelin inventory and 25% of our entire Stinger stockpile since the war began. So the Pentagon needs to require the defense industry now to model maximum missile production rates, figure out where the supply chain failures are, use the Defense Production Act to help build surge capacity, as well as change the way we buy these missiles so that we're buying more of the long lead items uh, at a time so that we can build up those stockpiles. Finally, uh, I would just say we need to do a better job of explaining to the American public why Taiwan matters and why we should defend it. I think our current plans for defending Taiwan are built on some rosy assumptions about the authorities that a future or current president would have to do it, which in turn rests on the assumption that Congress and the American people would support going to war over Taiwan. And unless we do a better job of explaining why it matters, I'm not sure we can count on that assumption. You can make the case economically, you can make it in terms of ideology and shared values, Matt Pottinger has made the case far better than, than I have multiple times. So I won't bore you with it here, but we have to communicate it in a way that will resonate in Northeast Wisconsin as to why Taiwan matters. And by defending Taiwan, we're defending the free world. Oh, thanks. As a, uh, you know, that was quite a, uh, a, a, a broad answer. And uh, I, I got to double down on what you said, long range anti-ship cruise missiles, El Razo, something you and I have both argued for in print multiple times, as has Brad Bowman from FDD. Um, we're, you know, there's 88 being built this year, and you know, I was pounding the table. What's going on? And finally, someone whispered in my ear, "Hey, that's max capacity." Well, when your max capacity is about five percent of what you need long term, that you know something's wrong in your defense industrial base. So that's a great point. Well, look, you you, you teed up Matt Pottinger pretty well. Uh, Congressman Gallagher has laid out an ambitious plan that that could commit people of uh, northern Wisconsin there to a fight in the uh, Western Pacific. Uh, Matt, why should we be defending Taiwan? But that's Mike's uh, paper uh, and and his summary that you just heard of it. Uh, are, are absolutely spot on. 
these are the kinds of things that we really need to be focused on. It's, it has to do with logistics, our industrial uh, uh, capacity, making sure that we're stockpiling munitions. And when, when we talk about why it matters, you remember back in the, uh, you know, the 1960s and 70s as, as the Vietnam War came to a, you know, an unhappy end uh, uh, for us, a lot of people predicted at the time that, um, you know, the, you remember domino theory, the idea that, uh, that we were going to be left in a far worse position, communism was going to run rampant across the region. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, we we uh, uh, were, were able to recover from that, but this time is different. We're not dealing this time with a relatively small uh, uh, state, you know, North Vietnam. We're dealing with the world's second largest economy, a, a, a country that is now backing uh, for the first time in a thousand years, uh, China is backing a war in Europe. Uh, this is a country that has global ambitions, not, not just nationalist and, and regional ambitions. And so the first thing is that because Taiwan is the fulcrum of this first island chain, if Taiwan falls, uh, just the, the fact that, that China has essentially broken out of the first island chain uh, capsizes the defense concept for Japan, uh, our, our largest uh, ally in the, in the Pacific. Uh, and China, if you read their propaganda, which I don't recommend uh, too often, but, but if you do read it, you'll see that China is actually questioning Japan's right to uh, territory that Japan currently holds, not just the Senkaku Islands, but even the entire Ryukyu Island chain, Okinawa, you know, places that we fought uh, bitter battles for uh, uh, to defeat Japan and then gave back that territory to Japan after World War II. Uh, China, China uh, claims Japan is, is not actually legitimate, um, uh, that, that's not legitimate Japanese territory. So what you start to see is uh, something, the things that we feared in the 60s and 70s that didn't happen are, are much more likely to happen here. Now, some of the other consequences uh, for uh, semiconductor supply chains, our economy, in case you didn't notice, uh, everything runs on semiconductors. That's why we're having trouble, you know, you have trouble finding even used cars anymore in the United States because of the shortage of, of chips. Now, you think about the fact that Taiwan produces most of the most advanced chips in the world. Um, it will uh, it badly uh, upset uh, America's economy in ways that would be reminiscent of the COVID crisis. Uh, you also would have uh, the horizontal spread of nuclear weapons because countries would no longer believe that the United States is, uh, you know, that our extended deterrent, our nuclear umbrella is something that can be relied on. So I would imagine that Japan, South Korea, Australia, perhaps Vietnam would uh, pursue nuclear weapons as well. A and again, we've, we've had this amazing success at keeping the number of nuclear powers in the world since World War II uh, to, you know, single digits. Uh, th this this would really be the end of uh, of that and and all of the problems attendant to that, and I can go on, but I won't. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. And of course, uh, your discussion on Chinese propaganda reminds me of the famous the third flag raising at Iwo Jima, where the Chinese flag was raised. I think we've lost that photo to history, but um, uh, with two former Marines here, we have to have a little bit of fun. The uh, hey, you know, you've great discussion of the why uh, and now the how. Representative Gallagher calls for ending strategic ambiguity. What are your thoughts on changing this 40-year policy? Yeah, so look, I, I, I noticed that Mike, Mike listed that last out of the 10 things that he put in his paper. And I think that's appropriate because it's actually the least important step of the 10 steps that Mike laid out. Um, my, my view is that there, there, there are other things that might even be more uh, important in terms of signaling American will than having the president uh, raise uh, you, you know, end strategic ambiguity. For example, the, the Congress could consider uh, passing an authorization for the use of military force. In other words, giving the president that check in advance uh, without, without forcing or cornering the president into announcing what he's going to do. Uh, having worked in the White House, I'm, I'm a believer in, in maintaining optionality for a president, not cornering him and painting too many red lines around him, but the United States Congress can signal that the American people uh, represented by Congress uh, are uh, giving the president the, uh, the right 
to use military force without having to go through the political rigmarole uh, once a very, very um, uh, uh, horrible crisis is, is already unfolding. You don't, you don't want to waste a minute um, after China, uh, you know, has, has launched an invasion. So that's one thing that could be considered. But the things that Mike lays out, steps one through nine, uh, which are about uh, putting facts on the ground, to, to use a phrase the Chinese like to use a lot, putting munitions distributed across uh, the first island chain and in Taiwan itself, uh, putting, you know, basically food for thought that, that will challenge China's war plans, challenge their assumptions about whether they're going to be able to fight a war and actually win uh, or, or to be able to win quickly. Uh, you know, as the Russians have now learned, um, uh, those kinds of assumptions can be dashed. It's even harder when you're crossing a strait of water uh, than when you're just driving uh, your tanks across uh, uh, you know, the, the border of your neighbor. So uh, I would look to steps one through nine as a pretty that Mike wrote out as, as really the things we need to be talking about and doing. Thanks. And that, that's a great point you made at the end there that, uh, you know, cr crossing a strait is, uh, you know, that kind of amphibious landing is something that I think there's one military force in the world that can do right now. And in a heavily opposed environment, I'm, I'm not even sure if there's one anymore. Uh, but that, that's a great point. That, kind of switching gears a little bit here uh, for, for Jonathan, you're advocating a, a completely different in a completely different domain and you're advocating a really innovative approach to supporting Taiwan. What made you kind of think and conceptualize this approach? Sure, Mark. Well, first, uh, really great to be with Representative, uh, Re Representative Gallagher and, and Matt Pottinger. Great to be with you guys. And also great to just take a little bit of a break from Russia, which I know has just been dominating all the discussions here at, at FTD. Um, this was a uh, report that we actually had been chewing on for, um, for months um, at FTD. And it actually dates back to uh, maybe about 10, 12 years ago, where we had watched the Palestinians wage a campaign internationally for recognition. It actually began in 2005. It didn't really begin to gain traction until around 2011. And they went to the UN and they started lobbying uh, all of the member states. And they were able to score some successes. At the end of the day, 138 countries voted to recognize the Palestinians. Um, they were able to join a number of smaller international organizations. They were actually even able to join one large one, UNESCO. They paid a price for it. But at the end of the day, this was a successful campaign. They were able to do so over the objections of Israel. They were able to do it over the objections of the United States, which was really remarkable. And um, it just got me thinking that, you know, look, the, uh, I, I, there, there were a lot of things about that campaign that I objected to personally, and we can talk about those things, um, but they actually, they wrote the handbook for how Taiwan, with the help of its allies, can begin to get that recognition that it deserves. And the more recognition that it gets at the UN, I think the more facts that it puts on the ground, the harder it will be uh, for China to wage that uh, kind of information and diplomatic war that it has been waging so successfully against Taiwan over the years. So the hope here anyway is that um, the Biden administration can embrace part of this. We've seen actually statements from the Biden administration from last year that they endorse a, uh, a strategy along these lines. Right now, my concern is actually about implementation. It doesn't look like they have assigned elements of the State Department to do this in a way that I think it deserves. Uh, so we'll see where they go from here. But this, I think, is the, the playbook. Thanks. And, uh, you know, uh, you have to think you know, we're combating China here. What kind of what kind of challenges do you think that Taiwan supporters face with China that the Palestinian supporters really didn't need to face? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, it, it, the Palestinians, they always talk about the UN as um, the home court advantage for the Palestinians. You know, they've got the non-aligned movement, they've got uh, the Arab League, they've got the uh, Organization of the Islamic Conference. So, you know, just de facto, they've got something like 90 countries that are already lined up in their favor. With China, it's very different. I mean, I think there's 13 states, if I remember correctly, that recognize China directly. There are another 15 countries that have, uh, you know, uh, informal ties 
or, or some kind of diplomatic connection. Uh, but really, the Chinese have been buying influence. They throw their weight around. They threaten countries. And they threaten organizations that might recognize uh, Taiwan. So it, it, it's, by, it's a home court advantage for China, not for Taiwan. This is, I think, the challenge that they face. But one of the things that, that we looked at in the report is that you know there are smaller agencies, there are smaller organizations. China's not going to fight every one of these, right? So, I mean, we look back again, just using the Palestinian playbook for a minute. In 2017, they joined the International Olive Council, OK, right. No one is going to stop the Palestinians from doing that. You can imagine that there are all sorts of smaller agencies that Taiwan could be eyeing and they should be looking to join those, especially where maybe China doesn't have a significant foothold. And that's how they can begin to establish those facts on the ground. There are other things that I think the Taiwanese should be looking at. I mean, they have a comparative advantage. Um, the ITU, the International Telecoms Union, um, the WHO, for example, ICAO, the um, uh, International um, uh, Airline uh, Organization, these are all organizations where Taiwan does have um, a lot to give to the world. Um, it's not to say that China will roll over on these things, but you can see that it might be a, a battle that's worth fighting. Uh, that's a great point. Of course, you know, with the WHO, we all know in retrospect now that Taiwan had a lot to give. And that didn't stop China's kind of rapacious opposition to everything. Uh, I hope you're right, but I, I suspect sometimes the Chinese would oppose the International Olive Organization. Hey, hey before I turn to Matt, what, one other thought. We're not, the purpose of this paper isn't equating Taiwan and Palestine as issues, is it? No, no, it, it absolutely isn't. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, if there's an analog to Taiwan in the Middle East, it's it's probably Israel um, as a democratic society, advanced technological society that's surrounded by by enemies and has uh, fought tooth and nail for its survival. Um, you know, I, I think that it's just worth noting here that the Palestinians did this against the will of a superpower, against the will of the United States. And that's, I think, the lesson to be learned is that there are gains to be made in this space. But by no means would I say that, uh, you know, the, the Palestinians deserved to, to notch these wins. I'm just noting that they did and that that should be a blueprint uh, for, for Taiwan. It's just, it, it, I think it's, it shows you what is possible. Uh, and that, that was really the point of the paper. And thanks for that clarity. That's great. You know, and, and you know, here at FTD, Brad uh, Bowman and I have been doing a lot of writing about these beleaguered democracies. The, the nexus between Taiwan, uh, Ukraine, uh, Taiwan, Ukraine, Israel, maybe even Georgia is, is really becoming clear. Um, now, Matt, and we, international olives off the table. Uh, which international organizations would you think uh, Jonathan's policy might have the best opportunity to succeed in? Well, yeah, I mean, Mark, you and, and Jonathan and, and Rich Goldberg laid out pretty well in the paper. I think that, I mean, first, it's looking for places where Taiwan has a natural advantage, and they've got a lot. They're one of the world's leading technology players. Uh, they uh, are a country that has had the best performance in the world, starting the earliest in, uh, in the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, there's a lot for all of us to learn from Taiwan on, on uh, public health. Um, and then, and then it's looking for, you know, those, whether it's the Olive, uh, you know, commission or, or looking to join various treaties that, uh, there are a lot of them, uh, that, that we, uh, are signatories to, and that don't prohibit, um, uh, countries, uh, or, or governments from joining, um, uh, even, even if they're not a, uh, even, even if they have a small number of countries that recognize them formally and diplomatically, that shouldn't preclude them from being able to participate. What, but what, you know, a flip side of this, one of the things that we need to be doing, one of the things I learned um, uh, you know, the hard way from just witnessing Beijing's uh, ability to game the international organizations and the UN system, it's never because they're using large amounts of money uh, they China doesn't spend that much money at the UN. I mean, it's a joke. They and yet they end up having the most influence, outsized influence. They give very little money to the World Health Organization. We we give the World Organization the, the you know half the pie, uh, and yet Beijing was able to call the shots. The way they're able to do this is through corruption, and uh, also through the skillful placement of their cadres, Communist Party cadres 
throughout the system, not just in the lead role, the, the, the director and deputy director level, although they fight tooth and nail to get those jobs as well, but the unholy trinity of jobs that they place their people in are the IT department, head of IT. Uh, that's what, you know, the, the food and agriculture organization, as soon as China got hold of there, they shifted their whole network to, the, to Huawei and to the, the Chinese cloud so they could read what all of the diplomats and, and workers there were writing and, and doing. Uh, it, so it's IT, it's human resources. So the World Bank, which we, we are, we always have an American as the head of the World Bank, yet China get, derives far more benefit uh, from the World Bank. They're the number one recipient of largesse from the World Bank, and they're, they are by far the number one contracting. It's Chinese state-owned enterprises receive the, the lion's share of contracts uh, from World Bank loans. Part of that is because China has been able to jam its people in at many different levels uh, through work at, in the Human Resources Department. And the final one is in, in the General Counsel's Office. So the, the, the one country that has no rule of law is pretty effective at putting its lawyers into uh, UN organizations. And so that's why, it, for example, the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, which Taiwan should be a party to, China, the, the, the general counsel there was able to shut down investigations into corruption and failures and, and, and other things that should have been uh, uh, made transparent and investigated. So that's the unholy trinity together with taking the leadership roles. We need to fight much, much harder, especially for the amount of money that we're putting into these organizations. We need to, we need to fight to diminish China's influence in them and, and to empower uh, ourselves and, and some of our like-minded partners to call the shots there. But thanks, and, and you're you're being uh, modest there. I think people should know the role that you played and uh, Mike Pompeo played in the World Intellectual Property Organization, where you know two years ago we defeated the Chinese candidate, the direct, deputy director, from becoming director. And and in that case, I think it was highly likely that she would have moved the servers from Geneva to Beijing. <laughs> yeah. And you know, basically right. all our intellectual property would have been sitting in China. I think they can steal it in Geneva. I know they can steal it in Beijing. And you know, and uh, you know, if I were someone who'd written a patent recently, the last place I'd want to put it is Whippo. But you and uh, and Mike Pompeo laid well, a strong- And, and I should add, and also Secretary Mike Pompeo and also Deputy Secretary Steve Began played yeah. the absolutely pivotal role there. They basically, uh, took took their own department by the lapels and said, "Look, guys, you got to. <laughs> these are horse races. You got to actually get you know get in there. You can't just. I mean, th there was a policy in place at the State Department that our diplomats were not allowed to horse trade. It, it was considered somehow uncouth. And so what we basically said was, no, we're gonna we're gonna talk to our allies and friends. We're gonna coordinate." Imagine that we're actually actually coordinate. So Steve Began and Mike Pompeo uh, and others as well, uh, Annie Vu and, and and a lot of people at the NSC and at, at State played an amazing role in kind of getting that over the finish line. That's that's the old Cordell Hall rules of State Department. Uh, you know, gentlemen, don't read other gentlemen's mail. That didn't work out for us in the 1930s, and it won't work out for us now. And, and it reminds me, the International Telecommunications Union, the presidency's coming up. The lead candidate right now is a Russian. You know, a bastion of transparency and rule of law uh, and the secondary candidates, a U.S. Uh, candidate. Now, look, she's not going to be our person in the ITU, but I'd, mu I'd much rather have a, uh, a dispassionate, unaligned, neutral person running the ITU than a Russian technocrat. Um, it's a great point. Um, shifting back, uh, uh, Representative Gallagher, you called for hardening targets and building resilience in the U.S., uh, you know, building on the significant work you did during the Cyberspace Slaring Commission. Can you explain to the uh, audience what you mean by that? Well, think about the key PLA missiles, aircraft, air defenses, and amphibious forces that would be involved in any Taiwan scenario would be based along the Chinese coast. So if we're going to have a chance of effectively defending Taiwan, if we're in, if we are actually engaged in defense of Taiwan, that leads you to the requirement of hitting Chinese territory which it's worth thinking through the authorities that would be necessary for that. I think, Matt, though we disagree about strategic ambiguity, one, I think his point about strategic capability mattering more than strategic ambiguity is, is the right point. And I totally agree. And indeed, in the paper, talk about the need for authorities prior to an invasion happening, because they will, of course, try and pursue a fait accompli, in which case we won't have time, particularly if Congress is not in session, to convene provide an AUMF. And I really doubt whether a president would be willing to 
engage with a nuclear armed adversary solely relying upon the inherent authority uh, under Article Two, the executive branch. So once we've hit their territory, territory, we'd have to prepare for Chinese retaliation against the homeland below the nuclear threshold. Heck, they might do it in the cyber domain prior to us taking any action against them. And just imagine if they were able to destroy the munitions plant, some of which are single points of failure for our entire production lines, other key industrial sites, the US could find itself incapable of sustaining a protracted conventional war and forcing an, an unwinnable, it, we'd be forced into an unwinnable choice between nuclear esca- escalation or surrender. And then I think the most vulnerable domestic targets, as you know, Mark, better than anyone, would be our critical infrastructure. Um, you know, I think the possibility of physical sabotage is a threat, but the most likely form of attack is, is in the cyber domain. Uh, the CCP can employ cyber effects to paralyze critical sectors such as power and water in an attempt to weaken America's will to fight. And so one of our recommendations coming out of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission was to enhance domestic cyber resilience, including by codifying this concept of systemically important critical infrastructure so that we wouldn't be as vulnerable in such uh, in such a scenario, as well as other recommendations. You know, one of the big things that came out of the commission that you and I worked on together was to implement a continuity of the economy plan to restore critical functions across all of American society in the event of a catastrophic disruption. And again, without getting into anything classified, I just think we have not done enough in terms of how this conflict would look like. And my strong belief is that Las Vegas rules would not apply. What happens in the strait will not stay in the strait. And this could quickly escalate. And if Americans, even though sitting in uh, the heart of the Midwest, think that they're immune from some of the consequences of this conflict, I just I just think that's a naive assumption. You know, I think that's a great point. And I think we may get to see some of that if if we are able to ratchet up the sanctions and our European allies really join in on the Russians. You know, I think the fragility of our critical infrastructure might be exposed in in a Russian and Russian malicious cyber activity. I, I do think I need to give a shout out here to Dr. Samantha Ravage at FDD. Her work on continuing the economy has been dispositive. It drove the commission's work. And then really appreciate you and Senator King in a very bipartisan effort came together with a letter uh, as the you know, last December to the administration asking where their continuing the economy planning was because one year into a two year review process, it's fairly obvious to both you and Senator King that nothing had happened. And I'm, I'm very worried that the administration's not taking this as serious as, as some of the other cyber resilience efforts where they, you know, we have to acknowledge that both the Trump and Biden administrations worked hard on over, over the last two to three years. Um, uh, Jonathan, if I could bounce back to you, um, you know, uh, on the thoughts of uh, international organizations in, in Russia and Ukraine, we, we just saw Russia suspended from the UN Human Rights Commission. Does, does that give you cause for optimism uh, about your recommendation? That y- yes and no. I mean, uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, it's great to see Russia bounced out of there. Um, on the other hand, it did it had no business being in the Human Rights Council in the first place. And then moreover, the Human Rights Council has no business being on the Human Rights Council. I mean, these are countries that have no business being uh, guardians of human rights. So, uh, you know, that whole thing was a sham. Um, I am uh, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, what we've seen actually in, in recent um, in recent days, is indications from the administration that, you know, for example, if a human uh, or rather a Security Council um, motion fails, then they take the whole thing to the General Assembly. And I mean, then it's mob rule. Um, and I think you could see China really wielding its influence. Uh, at the General Assembly in the way that it typically has in the past. So, uh, look, at the end of the day, we have an international organization's ecosystem that is um, hopelessly broken. Um, for, for those who haven't heard uh, Rich Goldberg, our colleague Rich Goldberg, talk about international organizations, we've got a project that we stood up at FTD. We've looked at the, at the many glaring problems within that system. I'm not sure that I'm heartened by anything that I've seen recently. I do hope that in the event that we can mount the campaign that we've discussed that Mark, you and I wrote about along with Rich in, uh, in our memo, that you know it would be something of a war of attrition where we just slowly 
um, you know, add countries to the list of those that would recognize Taiwan or acknowledge it in some way or allow it to take part in some of these smaller agencies and hopefully help build it up over time. No, you're right. I think that you raised a very interesting issue there about we have to be careful the precedents we set at the United Nations today on this, you know, when we have our angst and our passion up, you know, but what gets turned back on us. I, I remember very early in the conflict, Ambassador Greenfield, our U.S. ambassador to the United Nations said any civilian death is a war crime, and you kind of have to dial that one back. It's two former Marines on here and myself. Uh, what, we, we, what we mean to say is one indiscriminate or intentional civilian death is a, you know, should be investigated as a crime. And, uh, and indeed, I think over time we've learned Russia has probably committed war crimes, but there's an actual professional legal route for, for something like that to, to be looked at. Um, uh, the uh, Matt, uh, you know, we've been bouncing around here, um, and we haven't discussed the new national security strategy or national defense strategy. Uh, one of the things we're hearing come out, and uh, and uh, I'll, I'll come to Representative Gallagher after you because he's already had a lot of fun with this term uh, in in uh, open hearings. But come to you, Matt. What, what do you think about integrated deterrence? What is it? Do you think, and does it solve this problem? Well, look, I mean, if <clears throat> if the um... If integrated deterrence was what we had in place ahead of the 24th of uh, February, then it did not work. It, it did not deter Russia uh, from, uh, from invading its neighbor and trying to wipe out uh, a, a sovereign country and to commit you know, regime change by force. Um, Congressman Gallagher has written uh, uh, about this very pointedly and trenchantly. Um, so look, if, if, to the extent that, that um, uh, Integrated deterrence means that, that we need to go beyond, inclusive of, but beyond uh, military means. No one's arguing with that, right? We want to see uh, the Treasury Department at the table when we're, when we're doing war planning so that the, you know, the people in Beijing understand that, yeah, we will unplug you from SWIFT. We, we, we will unplug your banks and, uh, and collapse your financial system. You know, try us. But the, the, the strategy, of trying to deny China, demonstrating that we can deny them the ability, deny their, their, their aspirations, assumptions, and war plans uh, uh, fr from, from ever coming to fruition uh, is, is really the way that we wanna go here. It's not um, uh, falling back on the idea that, well, geez, too bad Ukraine's gone, but hey, haven't we done a great job? And in some cases, we have done okay. The, I, the Biden administration's done several things well. I think they've handled the the uh, um, the, the the publication of intelligence information uh, in advance of, of Russia doing certain things. I think they've handled that very well. I, I, I agree with their aggressive use of that. I'm glad that that the, the West was able to pull together and to uh, uh, to, to actually sanction. Uh, Russia, but wouldn't it have been great if they had actually demonstrated in advance that they were going to do that, A, and B, that demonstrated in advance that we had the will to provide even more in the way of military support and training and uh, equipping of the Ukrainian forces to, to give the Russians food for thought before they, they uh, uh, pulled the trigger. So, uh, but Mike's, Mike's the expert on this, really. So I know there's no four star around Representative Gallagher for you to ask these uh, trenchant questions and, and get the obfuscating answers. But uh, what do you think about integrated deterrence and, and how we should be approaching deterrence uh, with China and Russia? Well, I've asked multiple four stars and no, none have been able to tell me what it is, which should be a problem. Uh, if, if, if that is the, the intellectual foundation of our national defense strategy. My problems with integrated deterrence uh, are uh, from least problematic to most problematic. One, it's a new bit of jargon that we don't need. Anytime you introduce a new bit of jargon, you have to subtract at least three bits of jargon. Uh, that covers up this debate we've been having for the last five years about deterrence by denial versus deterrence by punishment, which is traditionally how the distinction is made in the deterrence literature. And I would argue that in the previous administration, we had a workable strategy uh, based on deterrence by denial, but a lot of fair criticisms as to whether, particularly when it came to the military, we actually implemented that strategy in the Pacific. I would argue we didn't. Um, and, and, and I think if you dig into this new concept of integrated deterrence, 
ostensibly the idea is that you can combine diplomacy, alliances, and new technology with conventional hard power to deter bad guys from doing bad things. The problem is not only that those new technologies don't come online in time for you to do a darn thing about a PLA invasion that could be imminent in the next five years, but also it's becoming increasingly clear that integrated deterrence really is serving as a fig leaf for cutting conventional hard power, for underinvesting in conventional hard power and saying you're going to fix it all later when these magical new technologies come online. I think that will undermine our deterrent posture. And oh, by the way, if the idea is that we are going to integrate commerce, treasury, State Department more closely into military planning and operations, then why is there not a single reference to integrated deterrence in any of those organizations' documents? Why do we still not include those organizations into our uh, in our wargaming, in the Pentagon's wargaming over Taiwan? Uh, so I, I just think this is a dangerous um, strategy. It sort of gives the veneer of seriousness to, to an approach that really is all about cutting conventional hard power in the near term. And I wonder if you dig a layer deeper, and I'm sorry to go on, I'll, I'll end with this, if it also involves a little bit of mirror imaging, right? Like you saw this leading up to the, the Russia invasion, uh, you know, this idea that we could somehow shame Putin into not invading or hashtag diplomacy was going to affect his calculus, or as one anonymous Biden administration official put it, you know, Putin really needs to worry about building back better. Uh, and he's, you know, it, we saw the same thing on display in Afghanistan, right? There's a whole level of mirror imaging underlying a lot of this that really worries me because obviously, whether it's Putin or the Taliban or the Chinese Communist Party, they don't play by the same rules that we do. And we are naive to graft our value structure uh, onto them. So don't wind me up again on integrated deterrence, Mark. No, I, 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 appreciate, I, I appreciate that. And, I, and that it makes you're exactly right. You know, the if integrated deterrence meant that you were shipping weapons to Ukraine in December and January after you got those initial intelligence reports in November that you later released, then I'd, I'd say, look, you can put an adjective in front of anything if you do it right. Uh, and, uh, and you also make me think, both yours and uh, Matt's comments make me think that what we just watched in the Solomon Islands, where our diplomats flew in, you know, just in time, you know, two days late, you know, uh, to observe uh, China and the Solomon Islands sign a sign a pact. Uh, you know, integrated deterrence uh, is a uh, it's going to be challenging if it doesn't have a strong military edge to it. You know, the 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 strategy that was put in place, the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and the Indo-Pacific strategic framework from the first year of the Trump administration laid out very clearly, it was succinct. It, it said that the, the United States must uh, maintain, build and maintain a ca capability to deny China uh, control of the, the seas and skies inside the first island chain, to defeat China on the first island chain, including in Taiwan, if necessary, and to dominate every domain outside of the first island chain. It's very straightforward. It's simple. It's what, it's what the Pentagon is supposed to have been working toward for the last four plus years. Why you would dump that for uh, this, this vague term, I, I'm, I'm with Mike on, on that. I think that's a great point. I'd also be remiss if I didn't point out that here at FDD, Cleo Pascal has written some really good stuff on the Pacific Islands. And, and I want to acknowledge, Matt, that you're, you, when you were at the NSC, you had uh, one officer, Alex Gray, for a while working this specific issue of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Pacific Islands. And now it's grouped back in with Southeast Asia. So whoever's doing it, it's also trying to figure out Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and every other hard spot down there. And then, oh, by the way, watch Pacific Islands and it slipped away from us. And we really need to get our focus back. Those small kind of issues, you know, if you wanna dominate outside the first island chain, you better have, you better have the right access and China ought to have the wrong access in those areas. And, and that's not the way the, uh, it's bending right now. Hey, um, we did get some questions uh, from the press. I want to put those out now while, while we have a few minutes left. Uh, for Brian Harris from Defense News asked, uh, uh, and I'll pose this to uh, you, Representative Gallagher. Taiwan has voiced concerns that $14 billion worth of defense articles it has purchased from the U.S. since July 2019 has been backlogged due to acquisition challenges stemming from COVID and related supply chain issues. What, if anything, can the U.S. do to address this supply chain issue? 
and what what have, that, that have caused this backlog? Well, it's hard to say exactly what parts of the package were delayed by the pandemic and which parts may be delayed simply uh, and simply working their way through the bureaucracy. Um, but even with all the Ukraine arms packages moving now, over 80 percent of the security assistance that we provided to Ukraine since the start of the Biden administration came after the Russian invasion. So we need to get a lot better at getting our friends the weapons they need, not halfway through the war, not after deterrence fails, but before it, both so they can train on the new equipment and hopefully deter conflict in the first place. Even Secretary Austin and Chairman Milley, when I asked them a couple of weeks ago, admitted that the only thing that might have deterred Putin is more American hard power in Ukraine. And so I think that is one of the big, biggest lessons learned from Ukraine that we can apply to Taiwan. I'm actually working on some language for the upcoming defense bill that I hope will start to address this problem. I think Congress needs to be kept better up to date on approved FMS sales um, that are over a certain threshold, say, $100 million, uh, particularly when they involve beleaguered democracies like Taiwan and Ukraine that haven't been fully delivered yet. We need to know what's causing the delay. And if there are any countries that may not be under as much threat that are ahead of them in the FMS line for these capabilities that we could potentially shift around, $14 billion is a very large number. And if we cannot afford to keep that, we, we, we simply cannot afford to keep the Taiwanese waiting. They need help now, not after the war starts. You know, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, it's a reminder, you know, in the Trump administration, we approved almost $18.1 billion in arms sales uh, to Taiwan. And one of the most important ones, and one that you and I have written about, is the harpoon uh, in a coastal defense role. And, you know, now we find out only by asking ourselves, not because it was reported to Congress or discussed publicly by the Department of Defense, the delivery might not be till 2026, 2027, kind of in the middle of that Phil Davidson period of concern. And uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that needs to be fed back rapidly. It's it's not just the decision, the announcement that matters, it's the implementation. And I, I think the bureaucracy inside the Pentagon and State Department may not be as responsive to this as is going to be necessary in the long term. Can I do one follow up on that, Mark, too? I, I think, you know, and Matt knows better than I do on this. Um, you know, I think we're going to have to lean on our friends in Taiwan when it comes to investing in asymmetric capabilities. You know, I've, I've proposed uh, enhancing our assistance to Taiwan, but I think with that enhanced assistment, assistance should come more transparency on, hey, you need to prioritize missiles like the ones you just mentioned, mining capabilities. And oh, by the way, we both need to be able to assume some risk in terms of how we plan together. How, what is our what is our the structure where we're saying, okay, if, if the proverbial stuff hits the fan, we got this covered, you got this covered. I just don't see that happening right now. And it needs to happen. And we can't allow parochialism in Congress to screw up our ability to enhance our assistance package to Taiwan and to get them to modernize and invest in the asymmetric capabilities that we think are most important. You know, you're right. That, that, that's that logic you and I discussed of, you know, US plus Taiwan, two plus two should equal five. I think right now, US in Taiwan, two plus two equals three, because you have to spend part of your time worrying what the Taiwans are, are up to, and they have to spend part of their time worrying what we're up to do, because we're not doing those complex air and naval exercises that you see the United States do with its NATO partners, with Japan, with Korea, you know, and, and uh, people you think you might have to fight next to in a high-end uh, conflict. Um, the second question was from Ben Blanchard at Reuters. Um, uh, Matt, this is for you. Taiwan's President Tsai has championed the concept of asymmetric warfare for a military modernization plan. How is this strategy working? Is it the right one for Taiwan as it girds to deal with any direct military threat from China? And what more support should the United States be offering Taiwan in this area? Yeah, Ben, that's a great question. I, you know, uh, I, I think I think the real low point came uh, just before. Uh, President Tsai came into office where Taiwan was really dismantling its military capability, shortening uh, conscription uh, times, shrinking uh, the services. The budget had, had barely uh, grown uh, in, in the first decade of uh, uh, decade and a half of, uh, of, of the new century uh, on defense. So what the direction that Taiwan's going right now is uh, is the right one. It's just that they've got a lot of ground to cover, a lot of ground to make up. And when we talk about asymmetric, there's still, there's still um, you know, entrenched bureaucratic interests with, within the military services in Taiwan that believe that asymmetric simply means, you know, an item that can inflict significant um, uh, uh, pain 
on, on a Chinese invasion force. Uh, but that's only half of it. It, it, it actually, the, my definition of asymmetric is it's something that can inflict significant pain, uh, but at, at a cheap cost to, uh, to Taiwan. So an F-35 squadron is not an asymmetric weapon. Uh, it, it, that, that's a very expensive capability uh, that uh, is an amazing capability, but probably isn't going to really um, uh, survive, wouldn't survive all that long in, in the first phase of, a, of, a, of conflict in any case. So the things that Taiwan is starting to do and what it needs to, to, to redouble down with a lot more help from the United States and from others of our partners, uh, even if it's in a low key way, it needs to be intense and, and constant. It's, it's everything from uh, uh, building up munition stockpiles for things like anti-armor and anti-ship missiles, anti-air missiles, stingers. Uh, uh, it's building up a civilian, you know, bit better training the reserve forces, but maybe even going farther than just having the reserves and having some kind of a territorial defense capability where people are trained in, in uh, uh, IED making and, uh, uh, and in sniper uh, uh, tactics. So that, I mean, what, what the Ukrainians have shown us is what a light infantry uh, uh, group, you know, light infantry are able to do uh, in in uh, defeating and denying uh, access into their cities by a much more powerful conventional force. So more more UAVs, the cheap UAVs, uh, dis dispersing and distributing that kind of stuff. And there's a lot more that the United States should be doing on the ground in Taiwan. Even, even I, don't, I don't care if they're wearing U.S. uniforms or not. They can show up in shower shoes and flip-flops and uh, you know, uh, Hawaiian shirts for all I care. They need to be uh, on the ground, intensively helping train Taiwan and, and doing what needs to be done to make two plus two equal five, like, uh, like Mark said. Thanks. You, you remind me when I was uh, a, uh, an Admiral of PACOM, I was counseled for my uh, failure to wear a Hawaiian shirt to meet with a Taiwan. <laughs> for, for failure to wear uniform okay. Instead of my uniform. Uh, the, um, there we go. Hey, uh, if I, there's a second part to this uh, from Ben. Uh, Mike, I think this is for you. What lessons should Taiwanese and U.S. military strategists be learning from the war in Ukraine when it comes to dealing with any war between Taiwan and China? Uh, well, Matt, I mean, Matt, Matt just sort of identified a lot of them. And I would say my, my thoughts can be summarized quite in, in an unsophisticated fashion, which is that for deterrence to work, for conventional deterrence to work, you need hard power in place. You need hard power in place to deny an invasion from being successful. It's not to discount the role of soft power, but our soft power draws strength from our hard power. And to rely solely on a soft power strategy I think is a losing strategy. So hard power deters can summarize uh, my view. And I think that can be applied in any number of ways to Taiwan. I wonder if the other thing is not just the way in which um, uh, the information war has, has been waged, right? And, and how everyday Ukrainians have been able to use social media successfully to broadcast the war in real time, uh, which has helped Ukraine dominate the information domain. It's actually galvanized uh, a lot of support from everyday Americans. Literally yesterday, I went to a, a candle maker in Door County in my district that has now raised over $500,000 selling Ukraine candles because they've seen all these images coming out of the war. And obviously that's not going to win the war on its own, but you know that's, that's, a, that's an effective way in which information warfare can be waged and, and soft power can help the hard power fight. Um, and as applying that to, to a Taiwan scenario, scenario, I worry that the CCP is taking notes. I think one of their first steps in any Taiwan scenario would be to eliminate internet access and not only cut Taiwan off from the rest of the world, but to inject targeted disinformation into Taiwan domestically. In fact, I expect that a Taiwan invasion would be accompanied by some of the largest disinformation campaigns in human history and would be intended to confuse and delay the response both within Taiwan and across the international community. So I would submit we need to account for that now. And we need to think creatively about how we prepare for that and respond to it if, and, and if, if deterrence should fail. Well, that's a great point. And, um, you know, I think a lot of it's a surprise Russia didn't take that strategy. Um, and you, you, it's a good reminder what Elon Musk has done with Starlink matters. Yes. It matters in Ukraine. And then, you know, we had um, Brad Bowman interviewed Dan Hokuson, head of the National Guard earlier this week. And he commented that the 
Uh, California National Guard had done 1,000 training events with the Ukrainians over the last six years. Uh, and that, you know, really the vast majority of it was squad and platoon, um, you know, uh, combat arms training, you know, or not even that small unit tactics training. Uh, that has clearly played a significant role. I, we don't want to take away from the resilience and the skill of the Ukrainian uh, uh, military and population, but, you know, that California National Guard under the auspices of the state partnership program that we run with 92 different countries really, really did make a difference. Hey, we're approaching the end of our time here. I want to give each person a couple minutes. I want to start, Jonathan, we've been a little stuck a little bit on the military end here, but I want to start with you if, if you could, a couple minutes, and then to Mike and Matt. Yeah, I mean, look, I think we've covered a lot of um, what I wanted to cover in terms of the memo. I do hope that the administration takes some of its own advice pursuant to what uh, Tony Blinken discussed last year in terms of um, trying to get, get countries to support uh, Taiwanese participation in the international system. But I, I think it, I'd probably be remiss if I didn't mention some of the other great work that you see coming out of FDD right now. You mentioned Cleo Pascal, who's done a lot of work looking at those island nations. They are the countries, the states, the, the territory that um, um, lie between Taiwan and Hawaii. Incredibly important that we think about them as, as strategic assets for the United States. Um, my colleague, uh, Craig Singleton, has done a lot of terrific work on Taiwan, also recently looking at ways to increase the resilience um, of the Taiwanese people, trying to help them learn from what they're watching right now in Ukraine. Incredibly important to have the people of Taiwan prepare um, and I, I'm, I, I think they've got a ways to go, but I think uh, Craig's put out some interesting ideas there. Finally, I'll just note that Nate Pekarsik and Emily De La Bruyere have done some terrific work at, uh, just in terms of trying to combat uh, China's efforts to um, uh, gain that foothold in the standard making bodies in, in the international system. That's no less important than some of the other issues that Mark, you and I wrote about in that report. Uh, but they've also looked at reestablishing the U.S.-Taiwan Defense Command, um, looking at ways to perhaps even uh, return to this idea of a Southeast Asian treaty organization. These are all things that I think we need to think about. I know we have our minds on Russia right now, uh, but I think as this conversation is made clear, the China challenge awaits us for whenever the Russia conflict ends or maybe even while it's still going on. So many challenges await us. Thanks. Mike, over to you. Well, just one saved round aligned with this idea that we need to do a better job of kind of gaming this out with Taiwan. The same is true regionally with our allies, right? I mean, we need to, re I argue for reestablishing Joint Task Force 519 to, we, we, to basically get the, the war fighting structure in place now, not after the fact, and really start, you know, I give the administration credit for the AUKUS agreement. I think AUKUS has the same problem right now, though, as, as integrated deterrence, which is that sort of like the, the biggest parts of AUKUS don't come online, nuclear sub-collaboration until late 2030s. We need to be thinking what's possible in the next five years. So that's just one save round. And the final thing I'd say, in addition to just being thankful for all the great work that FDD does, uh, whether it's Jonathan's work or, or Pottinger's or what you've done, Mark, on the cyber front, um, I think what's happening in Ukraine, as tragic as it is, uh, and as, as critical as I've been of, of, about the administration's approach and the failure of deterrence, the bravery of the Ukrainians and some of the enormous impact they've had on the battlefield should give us confidence that with a sense of urgency, it, it is very possible to defend Taiwan from a PLA invasion. That is not an easy military operation for the PLA to accomplish. And if we get our act together, I firmly believe in concert with our allies that we can get this job done, but we need leadership and we need a sense uh, of urgency. And I don't see that right now. Thanks. And uh, Matt, why don't you bring us home? Yeah. So, I, I mean, all, just such great uh, comments all around and, and uh, uh, also echoing Jonathan's point about um, the work that uh, Emily and Nate and, uh, and Craig have, are doing on our, in the, uh, on China, uh, generally, there's a lot of a lot of great resources to look at there. Look, the the um, Mike's last point is is in many ways the most important because it is it's what Liddell Hart wrote about as the chief incalculable in war is will will to fight. And again, the the, the Ukrainians have confounded the expectations probably of themselves 
uh, and certainly ours and, and most of all Vladimir Putin's expectations about what they would and would not be able to do to defend themselves. They have performed in, in extraordinarily heroic ways on the battlefield and they have defeated Russia and now on several battlefields uh, uh, and, and, are, are, and are fighting to, to win on other ones uh, in the South and East of their country right now. Uh, Taiwan can win. It can win uh, against. It has. It is blessed with a better geographic situation for uh, repelling and defeating an invasion. But but it is also the flip side of that is that it's harder to resupply Taiwan than it is to resupply a landlocked country, uh, semi landlocked, but like uh, Ukraine. So that means that we have to supply them now. They have to supply themselves now. All of this work needs to be done right now. Uh, or, or uh, those timelines are, are going to end up working uh, to Taiwan's disfavor, uh, uh, but this is something that very much can be done. We should not assume that Beijing, just because things went so badly for Vladimir Putin, that Beijing will determine that it, it should delay its own uh, possible plan to, uh, to attack Taiwan. Maybe that's true. I, I, I certainly, if I were a war planner in, in Beijing, I'd be sweating bullets right now about the various assumptions I've made about how easy a war over Taiwan would be. But it, it could also have other effects. They're, they're studying uh, what happened. They may decide that uh, they, they want to use far more force at, at the outset uh, so that, you know, using everything they've got in their arsenal uh, short of nukes uh, to, to really put uh, Taiwan on its back uh, ahead of an invasion force landing. So uh, we shouldn't take anything for granted and, uh, and should be redoubling these efforts. And I, and I would like to see the Pentagon uh, actually put forward a budget uh, that reflects uh, th that sense of urgency. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, thanks to all three of you. That was a jam packed hour and, and a lot of great ideas on the way forward with Taiwan. As I'll wrap, I'll note that FDD is a nonpartisan research institute focused on national security and foreign policy. You can reach us at FDD.org, where both these policy memos are loaded, or you can find us on Twitter at FDD. Thank you all very much.